This is the full-length geology talk program that was shown briefly in our Capitol Reef National Park camping trip video. I am publishing the full presentation separately because some people may be interested in it, but it doesn't make sense to include the full presentation in our trip video. To watch that video, click on the card above or a link in the description below. My name's Keith Egan. I'm a professional geologist licensed in the state of Utah. I'm here to confuse you about geology today. When I talk to people about geology here, one of the hardest things for people to get their head wrapped around is everything here that you see that got deposited was flat, very flat, as far as you could see. To the north of us, of us was ocean, as far as you could see. To the south of us was the rest of Pangaea. We were at slightly above or slightly below sea level for about two and a half million years. In the uh, bottom of the goosenecks is our oldest exposed rock here. Starts out with white rim sandstone, which was a beach sandstone, a beach sand like what you see in California. Went, it went in a little a ways, not very far, kind of shifted back and forth as the ocean moved around a little bit. Still very flat. Above that is the Kaibab limestone, very dirty limestone. The ocean rose just enough to really kind of flood the area good. Some think it might have been related to glaciation that was going on at the time. Glaciers melted, sea level rose. Then we get the Mongkopi, which is this red hill that you see off over here. That was, that was tidal flats. The ocean went back out. It was all mud flats for the most part. In the middle of it was kind of a delta for a while. Very big expanse. The Bogkopi covers hundreds of square miles of land. It was a big, a big formation. After that, it dried out a, a little bit, but not a lot. We end up with the Chin Lee, which is this hill here with the green layers in it. That was caused from a lot of organic in the dirt in the soil. And as it decomposed, it consumed all the oxygen and the iron that was in it was reduced. Reduced iron is green, oxidized iron is red. That's what's on the cliffs. So just a different regime. One had oxygen, the other one didn't. And then the environment really dried out. We end up with this sea sand uh, erg that went on for hundreds of miles kind of similar to the modern day Sahara Desert in uh, North Africa. Butted up against the ocean on one end, green on the other. All these sediments that I've talked about so far were all derived from the east. Everything eroded, it came this way. We had the ocean off to the west, off to the north. It got a little wetter again. The banded rock that you see on top of these cliffs, uh, it's not real banded, but it's banded enough that you can see that it's different. That was streams that came in and reworked a lot of the sand, the sand dunes that were laid down for the uh, wind gate here. Very, very good cliff forming rock unit. Uh, the top of the wind gate and into the Cayendo, we had dinosaurs for the first time. It's when they first showed up. In places around here, you will see dinosaur footprints in the, in the Cayenta sandstone. That was a little more tropical, little, a lot of braided streams kind of reworked everything. And then it dried out again, even more so than the Wingate is the Navajo that you see on the top, that white dome. Largest sand sea in the world ever, ever recorded. It went from south of Zion. Well, most of Zion is made out of that rock. It goes all the way up into Wyoming, all the way into Colorado. It was huge and it was all derived from rivers coming off the Appalachian Mountains in, in uh, Kentucky, Tennessee area. Big rivers that came this way. It was so dry that by the time the rivers got here, they would dry up. And as they worked back upstream, it had all this sand for wind transport. It would bring all, these sa all the sand in, created all these sand dunes. And that's, those streams would kind of work in and out. They would come close to the sand. They would dry up, get way back, depending on what, what the environment was doing at that time. About this time in the Navajo, we were starting to pull away as our own North American continent. We started pulling apart from Europe. 
we started to rotate. That caused the change in the weather patterns. It got extremely dry. We kind of moved out of the monsoonal flow that was coming off of Pangea at the time. Then things started getting a little more interesting. After the Navajo, we had a tongue in the ocean come in from roughly modern day Vancouver, Canada. It came in, flooded the central part of the U.S. all the way into Mexico, and it would periodically get cut off. And that formation is the uh, Carmel. And you see that further, further east as you go. It's full of gypsum. That's Gypsum is a sulfate mineral, and sulfate is the most common ion in ocean water. So they had the sea, it came in, it got cut off periodically, totally evaporate, it would flood again. So you got layer after layer of the Carmel of just gypsum, sand, subclay, back to gypsum again. And the final cycle of that, the ocean kind of stabilized for a while, and we ended up getting uh, the Entrada coming in. And the Entrada's got kind of two stories. Here, it was on the edge of the ocean, very flat. If you walk 30 miles inland, it would probably be the same elevation as it was right at, right at the, where the waves were coming in. Very flat, groundwater was very high, and as the sand blew across it, it would stick to the surface because it was just wet enough, just sticky enough, that you would get kind of a nondescript deposition going on. But as if you went east of that, that same part of the formation was a, a sand doodle area, again, similar to the Wingate, similar to the uh, Navajo that you see on top. And the Entrada in arches is the one where almost all the arches are in. They're almost all entirely in that formation. Here, we got the Temple of the Sun and the Moon, and it's because it's so easily eroded, we don't get arches out of that. It, you could go up and literally dig this stuff with a shovel here whereas you got to bang on it with a hammer over at arches. So it's kind of two stories with the, with the Entrada sandstone. The ocean flexes back in just a little bit. We got the Somerville on top of it, which you see out at the east entrance of the park. We're back to mud flats. It looks very much like this stuff over here because it was a very similar environment. The Moen Kopi and the Somerville is they, if somebody just dropped you off somewhere, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. Although the Somerville is like 110 million years younger than that stuff is. Well, now the ocean's gone for a while, totally gone. We get the Morrison come in and that's where all the dinosaur bones are found. You go up to Dinosaur National Park, National Monument up by Vernal, that's all Morrison, that's all just full of dinosaurs. Uh, they get caught in floods. They got piled up in point bars and rivers, got buried, got fossilized. And that was mostly kind of a braided stream channel. And it was a lot like the Central Africa at this point. It was pretty dry, except for riparian zones along rivers. And that's where, that's where all the dinosaurs and the other animals hung out at. Uh, floods would come in, wipe them out, bury them. Very dynamic. Uh, system that was going on in the Morrison on the early part. The latter half of the Morrison, uh, the streams got a lot slower, more kind of like meandering streams that like you see along the Gulf Coast nowadays, down around Texas, Florida, just slow moving rivers with oxbow lakes and things like that. And so the upper part of the Morrison is kind of a reworked ash fall. There was a lot of volcanic activity going off to the west at that time and it was bringing all this stuff in. And the Morrison also uh, is the start of the very first time that sediments here were being derived from the west. Prior to that, they were all coming from the east, some were coming from the south, but everything was, nothing was coming from the west until the Morrison came, and that's because there was a mountain building uh, episode in Nevada called the Severe Orogeny, built up, eroded, brought in the material, for the Morrison Formation. So we went from flowing east to now we're flowing, or flowing west to flowing east. That formation now uh, is gradational to the one above it. There's no unconformities, everything was constant. It just, the, the environment just kind of changed into the Cedar Mountain Formation, which looks pretty much like 
the, uh, the upper part of the uh, Morrison. And it's what's the Bentonite Hills out here. Cathedral Valley is that stuff. And it's, uh, it's all been, all the ash has all been altered into clay. So every time it gets wet out there, Cathedral Valley gets closed and people get upset. It gets exciting again. The crust flexes again. We've got plate tectonics still going on. We had plate tectonics going on through the whole period, but now we're getting stuff driven from the west going underneath us off to the east, flexes the crust enough that the ocean invades again, and now we got a huge inland ocean. It goes all the way from the Arctic, all the way past Mexico, and there's an arm of it that extends all the way out into the Atlantic. So most of, the, most of North America was covered by an ocean again. And we get the Manco Shale de deposited. That's Factory Butte. All the gray stuff that you see around Hanksville, all the Badlands, all that. That's like 3,000 to 4,000 feet of basically ocean bottom mud that was a lot like the Gulf of Mexico today. So it was just a big basin. All of the Colorado Plateau that goes all the way from, Col from Colorado up into northern Utah, down all the way into almost southern Arizona as you get over towards uh, New Mexico. This whole area was basically a big basin on the north end of Pangaea where everything being shut off the huge mountain ranges that were to the south and to the east that are now totally gone with the exception of what's left of the Appalachians uh, filled this basin in along with uplift to the west with the severe erogeny. Those mountains are also eroded away and they're basically gone now too. And then after the ocean kind of finally drained back out for the very last time, and it never did come back, thank goodness, um, we had a lot of freshwater lakes, and we had a huge one in Utah that was bigger than Lake Superior, and that's what deposited the freshwater limestone that you see in Bryce Canyon. That's the youngest, that's like 36 million years. Uh, the oldest rock here is two and a half, or yeah, two and a half million years old. That goes all the way back into the Permian. And so that is basically the substructural geology and the stratigraphy of everything that you're looking at here. So that's kind of my introduction to what you're looking at. Uh, there's a lot of features that have occurred since then. You probably wonder where all these, what's up with all these black rocks? It's the most common question here. What are these black? These black rocks are volcanic. They didn't flow here. They were transported here from uh, Boulder Mountain and Thousand Lake Plateau. They were all, it's all part of the Aquarius Plateau. And at not too far in the distant past, they were all one huge plateau. And during the Ice Age cycles, and it was a lot wetter than it is today, uh, these sediments would get saturated. And what happens to these materials when they get saturated? Well, it's the same reason that dams blow out if they don't leak. If all that porosity that's in a dam was to fill up with water, the dam gets structurally weak and it will blow out. Well, that's what happened up on these plateaus. This material would get saturated and you'd get these catastrophic landslides that would come off the plateau they would go down, they eventually would grade into a debris flow, and at some point they would basically turn into a mud flow, leaving the big heavy stuff behind. Water's not gonna move rocks like that. Just not gonna happen. You gotta have mud, you gotta have lots of mud, a lot of water, a lot of sediment to move stuff like this. And these all came from the, the top of this is called uh, Johnson Mesa, and it's flat for the same reason a lot of things around here are flat. It was the former land surface. This thing here used to continue all the way over us, all the way to the, to the north before it all got eroded out. So the stuff would flow out across the land and it'd get eroded. And as this hill erodes back, the boulders that are on top just literally fall off. And this was concentrated with the flow as it came down the Fremont came out of Carcass Creek off of Boulder Mountain, and it was per predominantly uh, deposited here. You look over here, or you go up the Strike Valley here, any distance, you don't see any of these boulders because they all came out of this canyon right here. 
the closer to the plateaus you get, the bigger and more angular these things are. So this kind of indicates, that kind of indicates how close to the source you were with where this stuff was being removed from. They're big, they're angular. As you go further east, they become smaller, more round. You get outside the park, they get very small. You go out towards Hanksville and it basically they become gravel at some point. The basalt is so much harder than the sediments underneath that failed in the landslide that that sandstone, the shales and everything that's went with that gets ground up by these things. It's like a big roller mill. This grinds it all up. So by the time you get to here, there's nothing left but these black boulders and mud. The, the rock that was associated with it has been crushed to what you see here under your feet. Not the road base, but, but the dirt. So that's the story with the black boulders. They, uh, they also get a leaching thing associated with them, with the soils. If you drive around and you see some of these black rocks, if they've been flipped, they're white on one side. If they're upside down, they might be all white. That's a calcium coating that's on the rock and it's caused from leaching the materials out of the soil. There's a lot of gypsum here. There's a lot of salt here. There's a lot of calcium. So that stuff all builds up on these rocks. And there was a guy working on his PhD in, uh, up at Utah, University of Utah. And he's found some sections where this material was really thick, really banded. And he went through with a little tiny core drill and drilled out individual layers of this stuff. And he did isotope analysis on it uh, looking at oxygen uh, del 18, oxygen 18. It's a radioactive isotope. And he demonstrated over the last couple of 300,000 years of how this area has just dried up. The monsoon is shifting to the east. We don't hardly even get one anymore if we do. It's in the summer for maybe four or five rain events and that's about it. it used to be really wet here all the time, even back during the, the uh, last ice age, which ended about 15,000 years ago. So we're, we're drying out. It's, uh, part of it is because the Gulf of Mexico is, or Gulf of California is opening up. The, the plate tectonics have sh has shifted from being subducted here to where you got the San Andreas Fault now where the two plates are sliding past each other now. They're not, one's not diving underneath the other until you get up past San Francisco and then you get into the Cascade volcanics and all that. That's, that's from active subduction still going on. So the, the subduction here tells a big story. It's a complicated story, but it tells a big story of what it is that you see here. Without uplift, we would have had no erosion. You're not getting erosion on the Mississippi River. You're getting transport from stuff being washed where it is eroding, but along the Mississippi itself, it's not eroding. It's not really dropping down. It is on the Missouri, but that's that, there's another reason for that, dams. <laughs> <laughs> you, you trap all the sediment behind the dam and you release the water, it's now hungry and it'll erode what's downstream. So you get, you get oxbows along the Missouri River now that are starting to dry up because of that. But without uplift, you don't get erosion. So what, what you got going here is three stages. We had deposition, all this stuff got deposited. We have uplift, which was caused from the plate tectonics of stuff being slid underneath everything. There's, it's a little more complicated than that, but I won't get into it. That's, that's another hour's worth of talk. And uh, things got uplifted, and now we're getting erosion, and a lot of erosion. We got the Henry Mountains off to the east here. That's an exposed magma chamber, along with the LaSalle Mountains, the Abajos, uh, Navajo Mountain to the south, some stuff over in Nevada, uh, Pine Valley Mountains outside of St. George, these are all big lac lists. So they're basically magma chambers that never broke through the surface. So if you got a 12,000 foot mountain, you got to imagine what was on top of it to keep it from erupting. It was the cork that kept everything in place. So in the last 25,000 years or 25 million years or so, this stuff has all been re removed and it's all ended up in the Gulf of California. Billions of tons of material. Nowadays, it's all ending up in Lake Powell and in part Lake Mead. 
That's why they say in 200 years it'll be filled up with sediment. Well, it's got to go someplace. <clears throat> so that's kind of it. You guys got questions? I've got you totally confused now, I'm sure. That's part of my goal, yeah. So occasionally you're walking and it's seen like an extrusion of, uh, it looks like quartz. Is there any quartz around here? Not while there is in the sand, but the, what you're seeing is probably gypsum. Oh, yeah, and this stuff is just full of gypsum. All, all these sediments, with some exception, the, the, the sand, big sandstones like the, the Wingate and the, the Cayenta and the Navajo, that's just primarily just quartz sand. But the rest of the sediments were in seawater. And so as that stuff dried up, the gypsum and the salt and everything is still here. And a lot of places, if you look around, you'll see uh, little round holes in the rock all over the place. That's the gypsum and the salt in the rock trying to get out. And as, as the groundwater transports the stuff through the rock, it evaporates real close to the surface, leaves the salt behind. And, if you've lived in an area where you throw salt on your driveway, you know what happens to your driveway. It starts to break up. Well, this is the same thing here. Salt, when it crystallizes, has 17 times more force that it puts out than ice does. So it just breaks stuff up. So you got these little spots where water's trying to work out. It pops all the grains of sand loose because they predominantly occur in the sandstone and it's from the material being transported through the rock, and as it evaporates, it pops everything loose, and the wind carries it away, and it leaves these round holes, and it's a surface area thing. You get more surface area in a sphere than you do on a flat, on something flat, so. And they tend to follow bedding planes. You'll see places where they're just lined up, and that's that's because it had a spot where the water didn't go any further down, it just was forced out. And it might be a process that's not as active now because it's drier than it used to be. We're hiking the river trail and we get way up high. You know, you look at the rock and there's spots like you said where there's holes. But then it, I said to David, it almost looks like tar. It's like black coming down. I'm like, what the heck is that? That, might be, be pretty... that might be uh, like... stuff left over from pack rats, dung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was way up by the rock. Yeah, yeah. And it just, it just yeah, they'll go up and live in the cracks. And, it, it, and a chunk of rock will fall loose and the stuff will just, just like it'll hard. stay, I mean, yeah. It's weird that that was there. Yeah, it's, it's decaying organic material. And then they're really pretty, it's not lichen, but is it iron? It's like aqua, it was on the rocks. Oh, uh, there's a little, up here there's some copper. There's, this this hill that you see off to the west here is called Miner's Mountain. And it's there is some copper in there. There's You'll see prospects. If you go all the way out at the end of the Fremont River hike yeah, here, there's there's a couple of prospects. In the, you'll see mica and, and azurite and stuff like that in the rock. Not much, just little oh, pieces. It pretty, it yeah. Like, it was like a robin egg. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And you get up on the Miner's Mountain, there's places where somebody actually tried to mine. There's big open pits like this big. They probably mostly went broke, but. <laughs> because there's just not much out there. There's not much economic geology in, in Wayne County here, or even south down in Garfield. There's just, there's not much. You get down by uh, Lake Powell, we got some uranium mines down there. And we did have, back at the turn of 1900s, we did have some uranium mining down here uh, around the mouth of uh, Grand Wash. You'll see where they're all boarded up. You can look in, but you can't go in. You don't want to go into those things. They're probably full of radon gas. You get lung cancer at some point. Yeah. Water, about water. How do the fruit trees get enough irrigation here? I don't see any type of... Yeah. They do flood irrigation. This field here will be totally soaked. It was Saturday, some kids went running across it. They, they were like up to here in water. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just all diverted. It's all gravity flow. They do some spray irrigation over here, but most of it... Most of it is just flood irrigation from, they'll, you'll see where they'll trench and, and, and there's, there's a, a ditch right here that they flow water through. The, the wind was blowing and I couldn't hear you. You really talked about the water fold and how, you know, was that the tectonic plate? It is, it's like wrinkling a rug. You push on the rug and it pulled it on you. Okay. If you look at it, the cross section from east to west, uh, it's, 
pretty flat through here. All the Colorado Plateau got lifted like an elevator. And then it's the same, the same thing that lifted us here is the same thing that crumpled the Rocky Mountains and pushed them up outside of Denver. All the same, that all occurred pretty much the same time. And that one had a weakness in the basement rock and it couldn't go any farther, so it buckled and pushed up. Here it just lifted everything. Yeah. When you say it just happened, is that hundreds of millions of years just happened? Uh, fair, it was probably fairly rapid. It was, uh, I would say, 60 million at the most. We're still rising here, but it, it, it slowed way down. Yeah, what's, what's causing us to lift here is recrystallization of the lower plate underneath. There's a lot of water trapped in it. When you subduct uh, a plate underneath the, another, you drag a lot of seawater with it. It gets trapped, and as you melt it, it forms different minerals in that, which are lighter in density. And if you remember from the Wayback Machine, if you ever took physics, volume equals mass divided by density. If you decrease the density, you increase the volume. So as the stuff under us is recrystallizing, it's got to go somewhere, so it pushes up versus buckling. It's not a, it's not a compression. Compression is what made the Rocky Mountains <laughs> here were being lifted from a change in uh, mantle density. When you have salt under pressure, gypsum under pressure, it's very uh, light in density versus everything around it. And as you squeeze it, it likes to congregate and it'll form things that will literally push up. Are there yeah. one of those? Or is that well, one there's a few of those around here. The sinkhole is what was left of one. That was enough. That was old enough that that one all dissolved. The glass mountain next to uh, Temple of the Sun and the Moon. That was probably that one's probably a lot younger. It's got crystals in it, like that. It's huge. It was probably kind of brecciated, got pushed up just from the poor force of the surrounding rock being more dense, pushing down, pushing in. Up it comes. Yeah, that's gypsum. And as you get over past Moab, southeast of Moab, you enter the Paradox Basin, which is another big bowl of the ocean that dried up, and you've got salt domes all over the place out there. And salt domes are great for trapping oil, especially the tops of them, and that's where a lot of the oil wells get, get produced from, is the tops of salt domes. The Permian Basin down through New Mexico into Texas is the same thing, it's just salt domes. The Gulf Coast is full of salt domes. You don't think of salt flowing, but if you put it under enough pressure, it, it will slowly do its thing. What were they using uranium for before all this? Okay, yeah. Most, almost all the uranium they mined here was shipped off to France and they made little red symbols on pottery with it. And our joke was uh, that was the first thing they made that you could put your hot dogs in and keep them warm. <laughs> Probably not the safest thing in the world to do, but they didn't know about stuff like that back in the 1900s, early 1900s. They, they discovered that shortly afterwards. And that was short lived. They only mined that for maybe 10 years down there. It wasn't much. And that's out of the center up. It's in the base of the Chinle. To follow that up at Canyonlands, they said that they mined a lot of uranium up there. Yeah, over around Moab, there's a lot more. And is that yeah, the they had the, they had the big plant there in Moab that made the big Atlas tailings that they built a railroad spur in to take out. <laughs> that whole pile is slowly being removed because it was getting into the Colorado River. They, that was the way to get rid of the. The radiation out of the Colorado River was to move that and cap it somewhere. So they moved it up by Green River. They built a facility and put that in it. We ate at the Sunset Grill and we learned about- In Moab. In Moab. <laughs> uh -huh. And we learned about the gentleman that found the uranium mine and yeah. made uh, $60 million. Yeah. In 1900 or something. And that, yeah, in the 50s, yeah. It stopped all automatically. It just stopped being mined. Commodities are all based on what people say it's worth, and right now uranium is only worth about 40 bucks a pound. So you got to mine a lot of dirt, <laughs> refine it to get 40 to get, to get a pound of uranium out of it. Yeah, and the demand is off, prices down. Yeah. 
Yeah, the uranium mines down by Lake Powell, I don't, there might be one that's active. They keep talking about opening a couple of the others, but they keep saying that uranium is going to go to $60, $70 a pound. Well, it's not happened yet. So it's, it's repressed. Uh, the stuff over around Mo Moab, they pretty much mined that one out. It's down south of LaSalle Junction is where that guy's, that you were just telling me about, that's where his mine was. Sometimes we, we went on a hike today and um, there's like this big sandstone rock that's all confluent, it's all one chunk. Uh -huh. And then there'll be a strike where it's all, um, it's almost like shale, but of the same sandstone. How uh -huh. did that happen? Just a change in the environment, change in how it was deposited. The big thick sandstone was probably wind blown. The finer bedded stuff, it's probably got sand and silt and clay in it. It's probably more of a stream deposited. And depending on the formation, it could have been like a small pond or a lake that filled in. So it's deposited really thin this way versus big. I mean, if you look up here, some of this stuff you could see a lot of massive cross bedding in, especially in the Navajo. Some of those sand dunes were over 400 feet high. And then you have the little pockets, and then within the pockets are all these little pebbles. Yeah. Little round pebbles. Some of those, that could have been from earlier stream deposit. It could have been somebody tossing stuff up there. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of pebbles. Way yeah, up. yeah. But at one time, the land surface was a lot higher, too. So it could have been left over from when the streams were. Kids games. It could have been that too. Yeah, if it's within 10 feet, it could have been just tossing <laughs> stuff up there, especially if it's odd rocks. <laughs> Did the Fremont run through Grand Wash or how was that? No, the Fremont runs right through here. Grand Wash is another stream that goes down about, I don't know, what is it, 12 miles south of here? Six miles, yeah. That's a separate drainage. Capital Gorge is a separate drainage. Pleasant Creek is a separate drainage. And these drainages all change and they all move around. Up here at Cohab, you hike up, 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 up to get into a canyon that used to have water flowing through it when the sediments were up to where the river went through there, yeah. But now the stream got captured this way and it got eroded out this way, so it leaves this hanging canyon. And there's a mess of them through here. There's this one hanging canyon after another, so the water's Water's very dynamic, it moves around, streams capture, streams get abandoned. Come on, you gotta have more questions. <laughs> yeah. You bet, my pleasure. Click on the card above to see the playlist of all the videos from our Capitol Reef National Park Adventure.